Hello, and welcome back to It's a Very Exciting Time, a podcast by a UFO nerd and his tolerant friend. My name is Scott, and I've been fascinated by the phenomenon my whole life. And I'm Chuck, and I'm an aerospace nerd and a tolerant friend. We started this podcast because since 2017, there have been shocking revelations <laughs> from news of secret Pentagon programs to confirmed videos of astonishing craft. In a nutshell, now that we know the government has recovered non-human technology. Or at least we will, once Jay Stratton works his magic from the inside. True story. It raises a natural question. If UFOs are real, what else? Suddenly, some of these other parts of the phenomenon that seemed unlikely are pulled into the realm of the possible. And they may still be unlikely. But even if it's new science and not aliens, it's a very exciting time. (laughs) <laughs> Quick reminder before we get into it, you can find our show notes and more at veryexcitingtime.com. Support us by going to patreon.com slash veryexcitingtime, uh, where you can find extra content, um, like our Q&A videos, which we haven't recorded in a little bit. But True. Yeah. All right, Chuck. Today we are talking about how Lou Elizondo saved the Pentagon's UFO program. All right. Um, yeah, all right. Um, let me tell you, man, the research for this one was eye-watering. Uh, do you watch Always Sunny? No. Okay, well, there's a meme you've probably seen of Charlie Day from that show standing in front of a crazy person board with, like, yeah. red strings all over the wall, and he's, yeah. like, clearly, like, a little frazzled. That's what it felt That's, like. That's, yeah, no joke. I worked on this <laughs> notes for eight hours. Eight hours. Um It's one of those things like, okay, here's the thing. Big Daddy Lou has always been a controversial figure, right? Mm -hmm. He came out in 2017. He said, hey, I was running a secret Pentagon UFO program. And a bunch of people quite reasonably were like, the hell you were? (laughs) And started asking (laughs) some questions. Yeah, right. Um, And part of the problem is that since the 2017 New York Times article introduced him as the director of ATIP, the Pentagon keeps giving conflicting answers about the program and whether it existed and if it did, whether or not he ran it and if he ran it, whether or not it was about UFOs. Like, <laughs> Yeah. So actually, before we even start there, I, I just wanted to like highlight something from our discord. Um, someone mentioned that the book made it to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. I just checked. It's at number two on Amazon. Like all yeah. of Amazon. That's all of Amazon. Wild. Um, yeah. It's yeah. making a splash. He had an interview on CNN the other day. Yeah. He's yeah. he's uh, he's getting the attention that he was hoping for, which is great. That's awesome. All right. Well, I'm glad uh, we can keep <laughs> uh, the the thing about Jay Stratton will, will come in and uh, it'll all make sense. But anyways, continuing with the notes. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned a tip and like uh i feel personally very confused about like osip a a tip um Mm -hmm. a (laughs) tip i like that to to punctuate your point you're mispronouncing both of them (laughs) osip and a tap (laughs) (laughs) you totally you spoonerized them well yeah yeah you are not wrong to be confused and here's part of the problem is Anybody who is a detractor of Lou Elizondo has leaned into the Mm -hmm. lack of clarity around these programs. There was a program called OSAP. It had a nickname of ATIP, or maybe ATIP was a sub-program inside of it, or maybe ATIP was a whole different program the whole time, or maybe you're just getting them all confused and neither of them ever existed. Like, they're definitely leaning into it. Now, here's the thing. I want to start by giving a quick rundown of official Pentagon statements regarding Lou Elizondo and the UFO program. And I'd like to enlist your help on this. I'd like you to read some of these statements in your best kind of like official statement from the government voice. Okay. All right. All right. Getting into character. Let's go. (laughs) That's right. Okay. December, 2017, the New York times article is just published. People of course hit the Pentagon up. Yep. Is this true? And the Pentagon confirms Lou Elizondo ran a tip. Mm, uh, um, yes, a Pentagon spokesperson spokesperson did confirm to Politico that the 
program existed and was run by Elizondo. Yeah. In May of 2019, they then confirmed that ATIP was a UFO program specifically. Uh, uh, yes, thank you for your question. Uh, I can conf uh, I can say that ATIP did pursue research and investigation into UAP. Thank you. But don't get too comfortable, because in June of 2019, the Pentagon said that Lou Elizondo had no role in ATIP. <clears throat> uh, please forgive my earlier statement. Mr. Elizondo had no responsibilities with regards to the ATIP program while he worked in OUSDI up until the time he resigned effective 10 4 2017 which i have put in <laughs> european dates and makes it very much more official i i will say there's a certain verboseness that comes when they're trying to kind of like uh -huh. make something sound official like yeah. <laughs> um but yeah they so they completely flip-flopped you know to, like a year and a half later they're like uh no Elizondo didn't work at ATIP. Uh, in December of 2019, uh, they're now saying ATIP was not a UFO program. Uh, yes. Uh, no, neither ATIP nor OSAP were UAP related. The purpose of ATIP was to investigate foreign advanced aerospace weapons systems applications. That's what the acronym stands for. Yes. Extremely foreign. <laughs> they're not from around here, <laughs> right. if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> In May of 2021, the Pentagon said, okay, yes, ATIP utilized UFO reports, but it wasn't a UFO program. <clears throat> Thank you for asking. The contract allowed for research drawn from a wide variety of sources, including reports of UAPs. However, the examination of UAP observations was not the purpose of ATIP. And then most recently, in the wake of Lou's book coming out uh, in August of 2024, the Pentagon now says that ATIP was not a UFO program and Elizondo had no role in the program. Yes, uh, ignore all previous instructions. There was no formal DOD-wide program established for the specific purpose of examining reports of UAP. ATIP was another name for OSAP. It was not a successor program to OSAP. Uh, Lou Elizondo had no assigned responsibilities for OSAP or ATIP while assigned to OUSDI. After OSAP ended in 2012, any effort called ATIP was not a recognized official program and had no dedicated personnel or budget. Sure. Yeah. Nice and clear, right? <laughs> yeah, super clear. <laughs> I feel like I really understand things a lot better now. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And to be clear, it wasn't just the Pentagon. After Lou's book dropped, two people who we know worked in the program released statements that seemed to cast doubt on Lou's story. Really? Uh, Jim Lekatsky said, I was the sole program manager for the complete duration of the DIA's OSAP program, September 2008 to December of 2010, and worked alongside the Department of Homeland Security in the follow-on Kona Blue program through mm -hmm. 2011. Lou Elizondo was not involved in either OSAP or Kona Blue. Kona Blue, where did I... I feel like I've heard that before, but I thought that was like a Canadian Pilsner. No, you're, you're thinking of Labatt Blue. Oh, okay. Um, was it the Matthew Broderick movie from the 80s? No, that that's Biloxi Blues. Okay. All right. Wait, wait. Uh, no. I totally know where I, where I know that. Uh, last time I was in Portland, I went to the dispensary, and, uh, and I totally saw it there. <laughs> no, you're thinking of a very popular strain called Gorilla Blue. Oh, okay. Wait, what were we talking about again? <laughs> All right, bear with me. We'll get there. Okay. Uh, another person from the program, Eric Davis of the legendary Wilson Davis memo, which we've done an entire episode mm -hmm. on if you've missed that, uh, said, quote, Lou never worked for ATIP OSAP. He was also not in a support role to the DIA program manager, Jim Likatsky. Jay Stratton did provide support to Likatsky, while Lou provided some support to the UAP task force when Jay was its director. I am really struggling to mince all the words together uh, in a way that makes this make sense. <laughs> like You and everyone else, buddy. <laughs> what's the real story here? All right, so we're about to get into the weeds on this. If you watched okay. our first episode on Lou Elizondo, this is the inside baseball episode that I was <laughs> talking about. Uh, but the very short version is that the Pentagon program 
that was talked about in the New York Times article was called OSAP, but it was also known as ATIP. Hmm. And after that program ended in 2012, Lou ran a restricted access program also called ATIP with little to no official funding. And for reasons we'll get into, it makes it all confusing to talk about mm -hmm. and gives Lou's detractors an easy way to be pedantic and say things that are factually true but misleading, like Lou Elizondo was not the director of ATIP when they're referring to the earlier program and Lou was the director of the later program. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading a book right now about a uh, group who literally can't tell lies but are incredibly political and they just do these <laughs> sorts of like half truths all yeah. day long and it's very exactly exhausting. you seize on every little distinction oh yeah. oh, oh, oh. No. you asked if lou was the director of atip but you didn't clarify which atip so i get to assume <laughs> <laughs> all right all right well I've so got let's my... rewind the clock <laughs> yeah let me get my imaginary popcorn and we can get into mm -hmm. the imaginary weeds together <laughs> yeah so we're going to do this kind of roughly chronologically. I'm okay. trying to keep this a coherent narrative, so we're going to jump around a little bit, but I'm going to try to keep that to a minimum. Um, so June of 2007 is when the OSAP program begins. I've got a quote here from Hal Pudoff, who was the chief scientist for it. He said, the Defense Intelligence Agency was concerned about the fact that obvious observation had shown that advanced aerospace vehicles craft or drone of unknown origin were flying all over the United States, over waters, in fact, globally, as was the case. So a congressional budget was approved to address the issue behind the scenes. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid from Nevada was the one who was the initiator of the program, joined by Senator Inouye and Senator Stevens. Hmm. So is this the one we heard about in the New York Times article? That's exactly okay. right. Uh, according to the Pentagon, deliverables for the two-year contract with a total funding of $22 million were 38 research papers, an active searchable database, which now has more than 100,000 entries, and numerous investigative cases of in observed anomalies. The contact, ugh, excuse me, the contract goal was to study 12 technical areas, lift, propulsion, control, armament, signatures, redu signature reduction, material configuration, power generation, temporal translation, human effects, human interface, and technology integration. That is a massive list of areas for only 11 million a year. Like, I mm -hmm. bet the company that got that contract spent way more than that. Maybe. Um, so Bob Bigelow actually created the group that got yeah. the contract and they really did treat it as they were creating papers, but they were also hiring scientists, putting mm -hmm. sensors out on Skinwalker Ranch. Sure. Um, and the papers were produced not in the sense of here's everything you need to know about this. They were produced in a sense of like, what will the state of these technologies look like 40 years from now or something? So they were trying to kind of like imagine. And nobody actually says anything about UFOs here, but they're all kind of dancing around the point, which is we've been observing anomalous aircraft and we're now hiring a scientific group to study them and write papers about how they might work. Mm -hmm. um, George Knapp says... For the DIA contract, Robert Bigelow created Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, or BASS, BASS, a separate entity housed within his aerospace plant. He hired a team of 46 scientists and investigators, along with dozens of other support personnel. Interesting. So, um, quick math says 46 scientists, 46, yeah, scientists and investigators is already close to 11 million a year, not including mm -hmm. support staff, executive salaries or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so he created this whole program just for this contract, but I thought he already had a program that was studying Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are not wrong. Uh, that was actually an earlier program called the National Institute of Discovery Science or NIDS, mm -hmm. and that ran from 1994 to 2004. 
the story that I hear is basically Nids didn't really get any results. Uh-huh. Like they, they dug into it, but after 10 years, Bigelow was kind of frustrated. He shut it down. And then here we are three years later, he's spun up a new similar group to get a government contract to write up a lot of research papers and also do some more studies on Skinwalker Ranch. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, June 2008, so this is uh, basically a year later, Lou Elizondo joins OSAP. Uh, So in Lou's book, he says, In 2008, I was approached by representatives from OSAP to provide counterintelligence and security expertise to their office. They described it as a small but highly sensitive program focused on unconventional technologies. (laughs) Yeah, uh, and said that they report. Yeah, and they said that they reported directly to the director of the DIA and to Congress. They needed a senior counterintelligence agent to lock down all intel about the program from the usual antagonists, mm-hmm. foreign adversaries. Sure. I agreed to take on a role in that program, which was called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, which was a niche program under the umbrella of OSAP. Okay, so ATIP uh, V1, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> was uh, was like a tiny sliver of OSAP, right? Well, here's where descriptions vary. That is the most recent description from Lou. He says okay. specifically it was a niche program under the umbrella of OSAP. Okay. Other people have described ATIP as a nickname for OSAP. We know that hmm. Senator Reid used the ATIP name when he requested a special access program. More on that in a moment. Okay. Um, Jim Lukatsky, the head of OSAP, said that ATIP was the part of OSAP that dealt with military UAP encounters. What does the AAW stand for? Uh, it is... Oh, did I not include the acronym? I cut so much stuff from these notes, oh Chuck. Gosh, yeah. uh, advanced Aerospace Weapon... I mean, that seems reasonable. Okay. Something. I, I forget, something, honestly. Something. <laughs> yeah. The first A is A-tip. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, this is great. We're on page one of nine pages of notes, and I am already thoroughly confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, Lisa. So what I would encourage you to do is just kind of set aside what is the exact distinction between ATIP and OSAP. The terms are used roughly interchangeably. Best understanding I've got is ATIP was an internal name for the part of OSAP that interacted with the military. I don't know why it would need a different name. They kind of talk about it a little bit when Harry Reid tries to get a special access program started up that it needed a different name. Um, Jim Lukatsky has a very confusing quote about the origin of the name ATIP, but it all kind of boils down to the part of OSAP that Lou Elizondo worked on interacted with the military, and that was called ATIP. So... Broadly speaking, we're talking about the OSAP program, which was the $22 million budget doing research papers, Skinwalker Ranch, and UAP investigations. So I really thought that the SAP part of OSAP stood for Special Access Program, but apparently it stands for System Applications Program. Um, Advanced the... Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. That right. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and OSAP was not a special access program, apparently. No, it was not. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So cool. Lou goes on to say, um, when I was recruited to OSAP, initially, it was only to focus on the counterintelligence and security aspects of the program, meaning what enemies are out there that are trying to know what we know. And how do I protect the program? So I was not originally really responsible for much other than protecting the program. Okay. This makes it feel like he was kind of working like IT or physical security. Is that... that It's a little more complicated than that, doing counterintelligence. But yeah, in a nutshell. And Lou talks about this a little bit more in the book, how he was already doing this kind of work, like for advanced aerospace systems, where they're just developing the next gen of fighters. Mm -hmm. They would have counterintelligence people there who are... Uh, you know, looking for spies in the program, ensuring that information about it doesn't leak out, managing what information does leak out. Hmm. You can assume there's some disinfo aspects of it, but 
basically he was hired to do that for OSAP. Oh, okay. Now, Lou goes on to say, I worked in this capacity for some time, but as time went on, that evolved. I eventually became one of its key members. And although I had my own staff, it's important to note that I did not run the program entirely on my own. I worked with a broader network of experts and colleagues, including individuals like Dr. James Lukatsky, who originally led OSAP, and Jay Stratton, who took over after I resigned from ATIP in 2017. And although I had direct subordinates, I also worked alongside my colleagues like Jay, who were my equals. Huh. Okay. I'm I'm starting to put it together. Um, that's cool though that he was he was um, able to go from like counterintel to becoming like a core part of the program. That's, yeah, I like that. So we talked a minute ago about how Senator Reid requested a special access program. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. So this is June 2009. Um, so a couple of years after OSAP has been spun up, um, Harry Reid uh, wrote a letter. He said. Given the current rate of success, the continued study of these subjects will likely lead to technology advancements that in the immediate near term will require extraordinary protection. Due to the sensitivities of the information surrounding aspects of this program, I require your assistance in establishing a restricted special access program oh. with a bigoted access list for specific portions of the ATIP. Okay. So I, I didn't realize there was another level of special access program, um, mm -hmm. but uh, remind me what a bigot list is. I, I know <clears throat> there was some acronym, but. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about special access program is kind of the base level of just like, this is a thing with security. Um, a restricted special access program is there's a bigot list and you can't get on it unless you can't find out about the program unless you're on the bigot list. There's another level above that, which is a waived or unacknowledged special mm. access program, which is it's not on paperwork anymore. If anybody mm. finds you, you have to lie about it, etc. Do you um, think it's pronounced bigot or is it like bigo or bijo? Like, no, uh, it's pronounced bigot. Okay. Um, so th we've actually talked about this before, but uh, bigot list is a an acronym. It's a term dating to World War II when the Allies were setting up Operation Overlord, which was the <laughs> code name for the invasion of Normandy, which okay. obviously needed to be kept very secret. Yeah. Bigot is actually an acronym standing for British Invasion of German Occupied Territory. Oh. And you had to be on the list to know the details of the plan. But now it's just kind of the generic term for whether or not you're in the know. <laughs> it should have been pronounced Bijot since it was France. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so who, who was on the, the Bijot list for Reed's SAP? Yeah, so th there, the, list, the letter that he sent is still partially censored, but some of okay. the names have been released over time. Uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, makes sense, has to be read in to learn about the program. Senator Reed and Senator Inouye, makes sense. They're the mm -hmm. ones funding it. They want to hear about it. And the only other two names that have been released is Hal Pudoff and Lou Elizondo. Interesting. Um, were there other names that or uh, like other obvious redacted things in that mm -hmm. list? Okay, got it. Yeah, there were like 12 names all told, and we only know about five of them. Okay, because it, it's weird that they would only have the deputy sec, sec def and not the sec def or something like that. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, I don't really know how the chain of command here works. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Like, at one point, Lou was briefing the Secretary of Defense's office, mm -hmm. but his own boss was not cleared to know about it. Mm -hmm. So his boss doesn't know he's doing a tip, but he's briefing the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> that is not a winning combination. <laughs> no, it's really not. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> it did not end well. Right? Um, so yeah, uh, underscored reports, uh, Reed attempted to secure restricted SAP status to help increase the chances of being able to receive both information and materials from the legacy UAP programs hidden within private aerospace companies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Get access to all the good stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling hopeful. What happened? 
Uh, According to the DIA, quote, the agency determined that based on classification levels of current and projected deliverables, insufficient grounds existed to classify the program or establish a restricted SAP. Ah, okay. Uh, Yes, welcome back, members of the press. Uh, We'd like to announce that we are going to, as the kids say, hard pass on this one. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, but here's the thing. They didn't give up. Um, the nice. OSAP team tried again in 2011, requesting an S special access program from the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Group. Hmm. That effort was called Kona Blue. Uh-huh. Um, now, Kona Blue is a name that we've heard a lot about recently because um, when Arrow put out their like report about all the like UFO programs that ever, ever existed, they basically said all these people who came to us and said that there were crash recovery programs told us that the name of that program was Kona Blue, but Kona Blue never actually existed. Uh-huh. This is widely regarded as Sean Kirkpatrick just straight up lying to us. Okay. Kona Blue was a proposed special access program. It never existed, and so it cannot be what people are telling him. This is the name of the program that has it, unless we've got another ATIP situation. There's another program called Kona Blue out there, but presumably there isn't. Um, Who knows? Arrow also recently put up a document that was just all of the information about the Kona Blue program declassified. Oh, so wow. this stuff would have been classified. It is now unclassified. You can go read it. It's PDF. Um, and it basically outlines Harry Reid and all the OSAP people saying, we need this for these reasons. Here's all the things we will do with it. Here's our proposed budget. And uh, everybody coming back and saying, no, thanks. Mm, now, okay. according to News Nation. Uh, The short version of this is Kona Blue was a plan for the government to reverse engineer alien technology from a recovered UFO. It was a special access or top secret program created with the goal of acquiring, identifying, and reverse engineering what it calls AAVs or Advanced Aerospace Vehicles. The purpose was national security with the goal of accessing recovered advanced technology and determining its threat capability. So notably, they're saying this stuff already exists and has been recovered and is being kept in these other programs. We need special access program so that we have the ability to access their program. Uh, The program also had goals of determining if our adversaries, namely China and Russia, could have access to recovered advanced aerospace vehicles as well. Or the Pope. Um, so, okay, so they needed a, a special access program to get access to the legacy program or to other SAPs? Like yeah, the, that's okay. the claim. In their proposal, they specifically say an SAP is proposed as we have been informed that there is a body of previous work held by other entities that requires an SAP level classification in order to access it. Oh, Interesting uh previous work is like super tantalizing is that code for crash retrievals got it in one buddy now according to george knapp quote the opposition mounted as soon as dhs principals began to knock on doors and ask questions Mm -hmm. about how to access the unusual materials recovered from crash sites that had been stashed in the bowels of various defense contractors they were repeatedly told no and hell no (laughs) doors were slammed in their faces questions were asked calls were made and suddenly the enthusiasm shown by dhs honchos evaporated interesting as the new kid on the block dhs did not want to rattle too many cages and some worried the subject matter was just too weird and might be an embarrassment if the word leaked out huh Okay, so DHS eventually said no to that SAP, right? Officially, yes. That's what's in the documents that Arrow has released. Okay. But according to uh, UAP whistleblower and good, good boy David Grush, there's a little bit more to this. Okay, of course David Grush says, quote, Lockheed Martin wanted to divest itself from this material. 
The CIA said, fuck you to DIA and Lockheed, and it was totally killed. So Harry Reid's request to get the material transferred to the OSAP program was totally killed because of bureaucracy. Wow. Okay, first incredible escalation that the CIA is involved now. Like, let's go. Right? That's why we love our our boy David Grush. You know, he comes on in with the juicy stuff. (laughs) Yeah, right? Secondly, when did our good, good boy say the F word? That seems very off-brand for him. (laughs) It was on Rogan. (laughs) Okay, all right. So... He might have been coached. <laughs> might have been, yeah. He's, you know, he's trying to fit in with the cool kids. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, for the record, Joe Rogan is not a cool kid. I don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so this brings us forward a little bit. Late 2009. Uh, the OSAP program has been running for two years. Mm-hmm. They have produced a bunch of reports. And the time has come for the DIA to start looking at what they're doing. Okay. Um, according to Lou Elizondo, initially the OSAP ATIP crew enjoyed a good deal of support from DIA leadership as Jim Likatsky and his contractors circulated exclu- executive summaries. The email responses they received via secure internal servers were unfailingly positive. Uh, as time passed, it became increasingly evident to me that the tides were shifting. Hmm. An increasing number of OSAP detractors now worked at the senior level within DIA. Hmm. More and more scrutiny was being placed on OSAP every day, and new executive leadership at DIA was getting settled into their roles. Hmm. Within a matter of weeks of the transition, Lukatsky began spending most of his time defending his efforts instead of conducting research. Hmm. Wow. So, like, I knew that's how it worked at NASA, but it sounds like the the tide of or or like the the uap support at the pentagon is kind of like the tides kind of like Mm -hmm. nasa interesting yeah i mean every time we dig into this stuff we see this kind of whipsaw back and forth of yes ufos are real no ufos aren't real and the people who said it were have been fired you know like just absolutely jaw-dropping interesting Um, Lou says, I remember a meeting in the fall of 2009 that Jay and I attended with Jim. Uh, Just in case anybody else is not quite as up on all of the Jays here. Jay is Jay Stratton, who's another Intel community guy like Lou who helped start OSAP. And Jim is Jim Likatsky, who is the uh, rocket scientist who's running OSAP. Okay. Uh, So Jay and I attended a meeting with Jim in which we openly talked about the wisdom of Jim dropping the investigations OSAP had gotten involved with that many considered to be dealing with the paranormal and instead focusing solely on UAP threats. I was convinced that if we produced some solid work under the ATIP banner, there was not a person in the Pentagon or Congress who could look away and it would help Jim's efforts. We had found plenty of evidence of extremely advanced craft performing in ways we could not replicate and entering controlled U.S. airspace at home and abroad without any repercussions. These facts alone warranted additional DOD resources. I mean, there's some merit to that. Um, Did Lukatsky agree and tone it down a little bit? He did not. (laughs) Lou quotes him as saying, Lou, it's the truth. What's wrong with telling the truth? I mean, the truth is hard to hear sometimes, but I'd like to believe that I would be brave enough to do the same. I'm not sure yeah. if I would. <laughs> uh, quoting from the Pentagon here, after an OSD DIA review in late 2009, it was determined the reports were of limited value to the DIA, and there was a recommendation that upon completion of the contract, the program could be transitioned to another agency or component better suited to oversee it. Lou Elizondo says, in the spring of 2010, Jim confided in me that he was being pressured to stop all efforts. I mean, shocking. (laughs) Now, just to give a little bit of extra context, Lou makes it clear that the pushback was not just because the DAA thought this stuff was embarrassing. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, I hadn't actually even considered that as the thing. I kind of assumed it was because it was all sciencey stuff, not Intel stuff. And they just weren't equipped to handle it. Like DARPA, DOE, NASA, uh, 
the... as far as I can tell, the research and the science part of it was totally fine. You know, oh, I mean, DARPA, you know, does plenty of scientific research. Scientific research yeah. is not a weird thing in the halls of the Pentagon, but no. they were researching like ghosts and paranormal shit and, you know, like really strange stuff and dogmen and yeah. the hitchhiker effect and like. I can understand why people might be like, uh, eh, this is a little weird, guys. You know, like, Lou talks yeah. about UFOs, which is already weird, but he does a really good job of keeping it very nuts and bolts. Look, yeah. I don't know what they are, but there's something there, and it's interacting with our craft, and it's a flight safety hazard, right. and maybe we should look at it? You know, like, that's a hard argument to go disagree with. Jim Lukatsky coming in and talking about archangels and demons... <laughs> It's a little bit of a bridge too okay. far. But yeah. here's the thing. The pushback they were getting was not just because it was weird and might make the DIA yeah, right. look bad. Lou says, uh, this is a, a excerpt from a larger story. Okay. Um, DIA Deputy Director Woods uh, talks to him in the hallway after a meeting. He says, Lou, you know we already know what these things are, right? I wasn't sure if Woods was asking a question or making a statement. I'm sorry, sir, I said. What are you specifically referring to? I sensed his annoyance. Deep in my mind, I secretly hoped that Woods knew something I didn't. I hoped Woods would reveal to me that these UAP we hunted were actually some sort of secret U.S. technology hidden deep within the black budgets of DARPA or the Air Force Research Lab. Yeah. That would have been a welcome relief. Have you read your Bible lately, Lou? Oh, shit. It's demonic, he said to me. There is no reason we should be looking into this. We already know what they are and where they come from. They're deceivers. Demons. Oh. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was a senior intelligence official putting his religious beliefs ahead of national security. Yeah, what a weird conversation. Like... Okay, buddy. I'm going to go over there now and keep a healthy distance from you. <laughs> yeah. And Lou has made it clear before this that he looked up to Woods. They had worked yeah. together before. He had a lot of respect for him. And then this guy quarters him in the hallway and tells him, you're looking into the devil. Like, so uh, all right, man. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing they were dealing with. And yeah. Lukatsky was getting it even worse because Lou yeah, is yeah. at least trying to keep it nuts and bolts. Lukatsky is straight up talking about weird shit and yeah. people were giving him a lot of grief about it. Yeah. Um, quoting from a Pentagon spokesperson, funding for the program ended in the 2012 timeframe. It was determined that there were other higher priority issues that merited funding and it was in the best interest of the DOD to make a change. <laughs> okay. So that's it, right? OSAP, ATIP is dead. Podcast over. <laughs> Yeah, shortest episode ever. Nice All work, right. everybody. Good and job. Uh, no, of course, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> it's also still not our shortest podcast. But. <laughs> uh, Lou Elizondo says, The former director, Jim Lukatsky, left, and I was asked, as a senior guy, to help manage and run the program out of the Pentagon. Okay. I had recently accepted a new position within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. This program managed national level special access programs directly for the National Security Council and the White House. Now that I had broader authorities than before, Jay and I decided to move the remnants of the effort away from the DIA and house it within my portfolio of national programs, which ensured that the prying eyes of our detractors would no longer have any visibility. At the same time, Jay, myself, and a handful of contractors would continue to run ATIP under the proverbial radar. If I did it this way, I knew no one in DOD would have access to the program unless I specifically allowed it. Huh. Okay, so it's fascinating to see how this kind of thing happens, but also confirmation that this kind of trick is totally possible. Um, yeah. It's wild. Lou says the only contractors who would remain involved with Jay Stratton and me were Hal Pudoff, Will Livingston, and Eric Davis. Oof. Keep all the heavy hitters. Yeah, I mean, if you're only going to keep a handful of people, those are the ones. Yeah. Um, the original OSAP portfolio was much broader than ATIP. The decision was made early on that we would go ahead and focus the effort more to the phenomena specific, looking at the observables and the identifiables 
what could we look at? What could we collect on? What could we report back to senior DOD leadership? Because that's what they were concerned with. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like they're trying to avoid the mistake that Katsky made of not focusing on like one thing at a time and doing it well, or mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say yeah, focusing I think you on hit weird the... stuff, but like. No, for sure. I think he hit the nail on that. And also, I know that Lou gets a lot of grief for coming at this from a national security perspective and talking about it as a threat. But this background really helps clarify it. If you need to be able to convince people that this is worth looking into in the DOD, right. the language you use is, we need to look at this because it's possibly a threat. Right. Um, how much Lou actually believes it's a threat and that they're malicious is unclear but as lou has said repeatedly it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's possible it could be a threat we have a duty to look into it yeah now lou goes on to say something really interesting he says i am sure that our decision to nestle the a-tipped portion of osap away under his portfolio was unpopular with many who were part of the original osap program but it was the only way jay and i could figure out a way for a tip to survive the constant barrage of internal attacks. Hmm. That one line speaks volumes. I wonder how much of the quotes about Lou from Lekatsky and others are like sour grapes about Lou <laughs> coming out and saying he ran ATIP when they saw it more like he stole ATIP. I, th I think you're hitting the nail on the head. And I have to admit at this point, it's worth pointing out that while I was not quoting Lekatsky and Eric Davis out of context earlier, both Eric Davis and Lekatsky have made it clear that Lou ran the military UAP investigation, which was also called ATIP. Hmm. They seem to be getting hung up on confusion between the original OSAP program and Lou's continuing program, and they're not wrong. But I'm a little frustrated by how they've muddied the waters around the topic by playing the same pedantic grammar games as the Pentagon spokesperson. Yeah. Um, Lekatsky, though, left. It sounds like he left before ATIP version 2 uh, was even the formed. The timing right? is a little clear. I think Lekatsky was in the process of retiring as Lou was transitioning and yeah. making some moves. So uh, it seems like. Lekatsky may legitimately be saying what he knows. Um, yeah. I don't know. Naming yeah, things is It's hard. unclear. Now, here's the thing. So, happy ending, right? Lou took a tip. It's under his portfolio in the yeah, DAA. Sure. It, away from the DAA. Nobody really knows about it anymore. We're all yeah, good, right? Success. Well, there's one little thing. Uh, according to the Daily Mail, quote, after funding ran out in 2012, Elizondo and his colleagues continued their work using resources cobbled together from their other jobs at DIA and varied military and defense agencies under the new name ATIP. Okay. Good news, everyone. We successfully hid our program from the people who want to kill it. The less good news is that now we have no way of getting funding for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Elizondo says in the book, quote, we knew that the original money Senator Reed and his cohorts had secured for the program had run out. Reed thought he could come up with another fresh infusing of funding to tide our investigations over until 2013 or 2014. At the time, the hot buzzword in Congress, the Pentagon, and the intelligence community was ISR, which stood for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. At the height of the global war on terror, politicians fell over themselves writing checks for anything under the rubric of ISR, and it was not a stretch to consider ATIP as part of the ISR mission. After all, ATIP tracked and studied UAP with advanced capabilities that had shown an unusual interest in our military and most sensitive sites. Yeah. Whoever or whatever was controlling the UAP was clearly doing some form of ISR. I mean, it makes sense to me. It's, it's funny to hear this because I see the same games at my work where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, these are the hot buzzwords of this yeah, quarter. Yeah, yeah. Like, find a way to write your, like, <laughs> write your ticket that somehow references this thing, and it will definitely get prioritized for you. Like, ugh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Elizondo has been telling us for years about how the legacy program operates without proper oversight, but isn't that like kind of what he's doing here and how was it getting funding and 
I don't know. Yeah, it feels a little sketchy, doesn't it? But after digging into this a little bit more, I, I don't think it's quite the same thing. Um, so the legacy program is straight up being illegally concealed. There are people they are supposed to report to that they do not and will not. Hmm. It is unclear how they are getting any funding. Legally, they should not be able to get any right, funding. Yeah. So some funny games are being played here. What well, kind of sounds like Lou's doing the same thing, right? Well, yeah. not exactly. While it is unclear how official this version of ATIP was, it was not being illegally concealed. It was nestled properly within his portfolio of responsibilities. He was still working with Senator Reid, and in later chapters, he makes it clear that he was still briefing people, including the Secretary of Defense's office. So ATIP wasn't being kept secret. It was just given cover and restricted access by nestling it inside a loop the rest of Lou's portfolio. Okay. But I don't blame you for feeling a little squicky about it because yeah, it's kind of like, Hey, I'm really upset that all these other programs are playing silly games with funding and are illegally concealing themselves from the people who are supposed to have access. And also when I got my program, I immediately hid it from my boss and had to get money by pretending that we were a different program. <laughs> yeah. Also see this at work. Like, Oh, yeah. you know, you can work on that. Just, we just aren't going to write a ticket that's going to, that anyone is ever going to find. <laughs> yeah. You can just keep now, on going. If you believe in karma, yeah. <laughs> Lou was immediately bit by this. Uh, <laughs> Lou says, quote, Jay ran point on pulling off miracle after miracle. And we succeeded in getting Senator Reed to give us new funding. $10 million. We rejoiced for all of, 10 minutes until we learned that another DOD program had absconded with the funds. Oh God. Jay and I felt kicked in the teeth. This yeah. happened because the language on the funding bill was ambiguous enough for someone in a powerful position to justify kicking the money to another line item. Oh God. <laughs> and he can't even like say anything without uh, exposing the program that he wanted to put the money in. God, exactly. What a mess. Yeah, yeah it was a total catch-22. Um, now, here's the thing. This wasn't even... Funding wasn't even Lou's only problem. <laughs> so the, the, the point from here on in the book is like, Lou took over a tip. Hey, we're all good, right? No, it's like frustration after frustration after frustration. Yeah. Um, so... The 2004 Nimitz Tic Tac encounter predated OSAP, but it was a huge case with yeah. very convincing evidence that OSAP leaned heavily on. Yeah. And in 2014, there was a similar series of incidents during a Navy training exercise, and ATIP saw it as a call to action. Elizondo says, quote, based on the 22 UAP incidents involving the Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group with eyewitnesses and video evidence, we knew we needed a robust plan of action. Jay spent weeks creating an operation plan codenamed Interloper. It was a classic honeypot. We would orchestrate a situation that was so irresistible and almost impossible for the enemy to ignore. <laughs> So the, uh, I think we talked about this in the last episode. Uh, this is the nuclear strike group offshore to attract and study UAP, right? Okay. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. Lou makes it clear that the combination of military assets, nuclear assets, and water seems to be irresistible to our friends from out of town. <laughs> That's yeah. I get it. Um, it's the wet sciences, right? Um, <laughs> wet sciences. <laughs> I also love the phrase "our t our friends from out of town." Like Isn't we should <laughs> totally get that on a T-shirt. Um, and Casey Jean, in case you're listening, um, you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, our friends from out of town. I do love that. Uh, Lou goes on. He says to move interloper along. Jay and I circumvented the usual channels. Yeah, of course, the operation plan would be submitted directly to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We were hoping to go around the OUSDI because the entire organization had become infested with compromised individuals. I no longer trusted my chain of command with anything sensitive, let alone UAP information. Yeah, wow. That's like a crazy statement, considering Lou had non-UAP stuff that he managed as well. Like Mostly non-UAP yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a big statement for sure. Yeah. Um, 
Lou concludes this section by saying, Before 2016 ended, I received the news from Jay that the joint staff had rejected assigning Operational Plan Interloper an ACCM designation, our plan to lure UAP out of hiding on the open seas, where I saw a bold initiative to make sense of what our servicemen and women witnessed in the skies, leadership saw a great big bucket of weirdness that was not within their usual daily lists of tasks. They did not want to be associated with the historical stigma around UFOs. Um, do you know what ACCM designation means? Uh, I forgot to put the acronym in here. It's something about security. Um, okay. Huh. But basically, they said no. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. Wouldn't this be, like, crazy expensive? Yeah, you're not wrong. It does sound, from the book, Lou's a little lightweight about describing this. It okay. sounds like he had buy-in from all the agencies that would hmm. be involved, which is going to be, obviously, the Navy, but also right. a bunch of intelligence community people, because they were going to put... They were just going to pepper these ships with right. instrumentation. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a big swing, and yeah. the Joint Chiefs were not interested. But that's not even the biggest disappointment oh, no. he faced. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Lou Elizondo says, quote, We were told specifically that a defense contractor associated with the Legacy Program was in possession of UAP materials of non-human origin. Mm -hmm. When Jay went to inquire for us, the contractor acknowledged that, yes, they were in possession of this material. They said they would give us access, but first, we needed to get permission from the Secretary of the U.S. Air Force. Well, shit, that's awesome. In the word of the contractor, after decades, they were no longer able to glean any meaningful understanding of the recovered material, and they considered it now an expensive liability. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it makes. I hadn't really considered how expensive it would be to hold on to a crashed mm -hmm. UFO when, like, you can't do anything with it. And right. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. The thing we hear over and over about is the budget for the legacy program, the vast majority of it is security. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> like, it's not like billions of dollars poured into research. It's billions and billions of dollars into really good security and whatever's left yeah. <laughs> for the research. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, say, as David Grush claims, Lockheed Martin... And you got this craft in the 50s, and you've hit a dead end. You yeah. can't make heads or tails of this thing, but you're hemorrhaging cash, having to pay for the security for it, and the right. U.S. won't take it back. Yeah, yeah. I get it. I, I'd want to get rid of it, too. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, so Lou says, this was an important development. We already knew or suspected that a handful of aerospace firms had been cleared to accept and keep forever any off-world tech that came into the hands of the U.S. government. But they weren't talking, and they would actively work to get you fired or your clearance canceled if you started asking questions. Yeah, like, I'm still just shocked they got, got a defense contractor to admit they had some goodies. Seems a little weird, right? Yeah. This contractor was acknowledging a long-standing memorandum generated by the Air Force, which made the contractor beholden to the U.S. Air Force's strict handling requirements. This proved that the Air Force had indeed not only known about crash retrievals, but had a historic control over them and leverage with this defense contractor and probably others. Shit. Okay, I think I get it now. So the, the defense contractors want to get rid of the materials, but the Air Force is using their leverage to force the contractors to keep the materials. And I, like, I just hadn't ever considered the directionality of that relationship before. I always assumed it was the government, especially NASA, getting screwed by big contractors. But mm -hmm. now I think about it, I could totally see the Air Force like pushing contractors around, uh, telling them, like, no, you're holding it. You have to keep it. We're not going to house that yeah. shit. Like, right. you agreed. Yeah, totally. And in the words of David Grush, the CIA is tied up in this somehow, too. Oh, so it sounds like there is a big institutional reluctance to change anything about it. But the contractors, who are privately owned companies, are kind of ready to get out. Yeah, um, interesting. Now, Lou goes on to say, From the moment I came on board the team, I learned that the Air Force 
was stubbornly and mysteriously uncooperative on the topic of UAP. Their resistance was irritatingly real. Mm -hmm. I cannot enumerate the number of times we sent carefully crafted emails to Air Force liaisons requesting information or follow-up details on UAP incidents, only to have the requests denied or ignored entirely. Yeah, I mean, that sounds super frustrating, but... uh... I, I yep. wonder if they also like did in person or, but they may not have been able to, I don't know. Yeah. Lou concludes. We now knew the U S air force had long been a key player in the legacy efforts and the contractor probably had a good laugh sending us on this fool's errand. In reality, they had no intention of giving this to us. It was an in-your-face reminder of the power of the military-industrial complex, and specifically their power when it comes to the legacy UAP program. Yeah, I mean, Hanlon's razor. I I don't know if they had a good laugh. I think they would have been delighted. Like, oh, you're actually like in a position to deal with this? Great, please get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's frustrating because Lou you can get both reads out of this. Yeah. Like one read is the defense contractor is desperate to get rid of it. And please yeah. get a hold of the air force. And th- if they tell you, you can take it, we'll give it to you. Yeah. There's also this kind of, and, and Lou doesn't say this as much other than this one idea that they're laughing in his face. But, um, going back to the Wilson Davis notes, hmm. this is exactly what Admiral Wilson describes is meeting with these guys who are basically like F you. I don't care what your credentials are. You're not getting in here. And like, right. yeah, I'll tell you it exists. And if you tell anybody else, we'll have your rank stripped. You mm. know, like there's yeah. a power differential there that they kind of enjoy abusing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to get why Luke quit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, Elizondo at this point in the book says, I was beginning to wonder if we could go directly to the secretary of defense. <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. Why not? We get block- blocked, <laughs> skip ranks until you either get results or get fired. I think getting fired is going to happen pretty fast in this case. Lou says, surely, I thought, the aerospace firm would accept a letter from the highest ranking figure in the Pentagon. If we could get a letter from the SecDef, that should trump anyone in the Air Force from trying to stymie our efforts. Given my work directing the Guantanamo Bay portfolio, I had routine access to the Secretary's senior staff, but not the Secretary himself or his direct minders. Uh, direct minders is what does that mean just his his people like his secretaries and people like that that run his day-to-day affairs okay uh this feels like a setup from arrested development like i need ron howard's (laughs) narrator voice to pop in and say he did not have access to the secretary (laughs) exactly yeah now i don't want to get too into the weeds here but lou has a whole kind of detour here about how the Secretary of Defense at the time was uh, Mattis, who was someone Lou had worked with in the field. I told this story right. last time how Lou came into a bunker while Mattis was in charge. He's like, there's going to be an airstrike on the runway in 10 minutes. And Mattis like goes into action. Get all the helos in the air. I want to deal with this. And turns yeah. around to Lou like, you better be right. Like they knew each other. They had worked together. Lou has a lot of respect for yeah. Mattis. Um And he actually mentions at one point, he's like, a lot of you are probably wondering right now, why didn't I just pick up the phone and call him? If I knew him, just take him out to lunch. He's like, you don't break the chain of command like that. That would be hugely disrespectful to everyone involved, including the general himself. Um, Hmm. I kind of have my doubts, but whatever that, that is what Lou says. He's unable to get directly to the secretary. So, Okay. Lou says, I set my sights on briefing the secretary. I wanted SecDef's clarity going forward on incursions and range safety issues. I wanted a letter to secure access to the legacy program's UAP materials. I wanted a whole lot more, but I just needed an opening to plead my case. To achieve these goals, I began an elaborate dance with everyone in the secretary's orbit. <laughs> dance okay. with Here it comes. Bring it on. They asked Aver. Alex Dietrich and a radar operator. Then they wanted the reports, photographs, anything else. And yet, after all that, nothing got to Secretary Mattis. His three gatekeepers wanted to provide the secretary a solution 
hmm. not just a problem. Okay. I mean, I kind of get that. Yeah. He also mentions that Mattis was brand new mm. in the role as SecDef, and his minders were very worried that he would get asked at a press conference if it was true that he had been briefed on UFOs. Shit, I hadn't <laughs> thought about that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, Elizondo, at this point, uh, is extremely frustrating. Yeah. Frustrated. He, he has got the program under control. He's had trouble getting funding. He's had trouble getting anyone to take his plan seriously. He's had trouble getting access. He has found out there is stuff he is being improperly denied access to. He can't get access to the guy that could fix all of this. Lou says, quote, we realized that the only way to change the way the Pentagon was handling this was to get Congress to make them change. Yeah. And as Chris Mellon reminded us, the way to get Congress to pay attention was to take it to the streets and get the press involved. Yeah, take it to the people, Lou. At work, Jay Stratton and I made a plan that would go against all odds, (laughs) a plan to bring about disclosure. I would resign and go public with the mission of bringing us as much attention and credibility to the issue as possible. Jay would stay with the government and use the momentum gained by all the public attention to move the ball forward within the government and brief any and all officials who would no doubt suddenly be interested. They had to learn the truth and Jay would be positioned to inform them on a classified level. And he would be positioned to run whatever version of ATIP came next. I would also help educate Congress and facilitate introducing them to credible military and intelligence community members who had had UAP encounters. We would continue to work together from different sides of the fence to bring about disclosure. I like this plan. Seems like Mm -hmm. a really good plan. Do you know if Jay Stratton is still, um, still in the Pentagon? You know, I don't know that. Um, I didn't look it up. Um, I think he might be, or he might have retired recently, but... um, Well, Lou's holding up his side, number two bestseller on all Amazon. Yeah. Lou says, quote, I crafted two resignation letters, one for my chain of command, who, remember, are not briefed into (laughs) Arrow, a tip, and one to the secretary himself. The first letter was a matter pro forma. My direct chain of command was not read into our program, so I only wrote the very bare minimum, informing them of my intent to leave. I did not want to be responsible for an unauthorized disclosure. The second letter was addressed directly to Secretary Mattis and was far more detailed. I figured his staff already knew about ATIP. He needed to know as well. Yeah, I'm... I'm sure that went well. Um, (laughs) What did the letter to Mattis say? Uh, It has a lot of boilerplate and like, sir, I have a lot of respect for you, you know, yada, yada. But the meat of it is bureaucratic challenges and inflexible mindsets continue to plague the department at all levels. Mm -hmm. This is particularly true regarding the controversial topic of anomalous aerospace threats. Despite overwhelming evidence, certain individuals in the department remain staunchly opposed to further research on what could be a tactical threat to our pilots, sailors, and soldiers, and perhaps even an existential threat to our national security. For this reason, I humbly submit my resignation in the hopes that it will encourage you to ask the hard questions. Who else knows... What are their capabilities, and why aren't we spending more time and effort on the issue? Yeah, that... So, I have a question. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If he thinks that his resignation letter will make it to Mattis, um, why didn't he send a regular letter (laughs) to Mattis? That's a good question. <laughs> okay, cool. So I assume this went over great. Um, no, they happened? didn't bother to tell Mattis okay. about it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, from Gary Reed, who is the supervisor that uh, made Lou's life hell as okay. a result of this, uh, from his defense in the whistleblower, not the whistleblower, in the... Uh, sorry, rewinding. After Lou left, a bunch of shit happened. He filed a complaint with the Inspector General of the DOD. Okay. Gary Reed's defense 
uh, to that is now public knowledge. Okay. And Gary Reed says, on or about October 4th, after Mr. Elizondo had departed the organization, a second resignation letter was delivered to the USDI Chief of Staff Office. In this letter, which is formatted as a memorandum for record, but uses the salutation Mr. Secretary, Mr. Elizondo cites concerns over anomalous aerospace threats as the basis for his resignation. Given the uncertain provenance of the second letter, OUSDI retained a copy, but did not provide it to the SecDef office. Interesting. So, for some reason, they they thought it was uncertain provenance? Like... I don't think they mean? thought that for a second. Okay. I think they thought they could plausibly claim that and not send it up the chain of commands. God. How is that even allowed? <laughs> I don't think it is. And okay. that's part of the whistleblower, the uh, the inspector general complaint. Right. Okay. Lou Elizondo says, quote, I received a telephone call on my personal cellular telephone from Mr. Gary Reed's executive assistant, in which she said, Mr. Gary Reed wanted to speak with me. I reminded her that I was now a civilian and was under no obligation to speak with Mr. Gary Reed. Yeah. How many times have you gotten a phone call from your ex-boss after you quit? You're like, yeah, no, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Only once, but that's a really different story. <laughs> uh, I reminded her I was now a civilian and under no obligation to speak with Mr. Gary Reed, but in the spirit of transparency, sure. I would do so. She acknowledged my comment and transferred me <laughs> to Mr. Gary Reed directly. Okay. During the conversation, Mr. Gary Reed asked me what he should do with the letter. And I told him he should do whatever he thinks is prudent, but the letter was addressed to the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> Mr. Reed was clearly upset with me and indicated that he wanted to see me in his office. He also said that he would, quote, tell people you are crazy and it might impact your security clearance. I responded to Mr. Gary Reed by telling him that he can take any action he thinks is prudently necessary, but that I was not mentally impaired, nor have I ever violated my security oath. I did not meet personally with Mr. <laughs> Gary Reed after our discussion, as I feared he would take retribution against me. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> like, hey, I'm glad that his security background gave him that that like yeah. good instinct. Yeah. To be clear, in the book, he makes it clear he's not just worried that Gary's going to, like, yell at him. He's yeah. like, I was worried he would arrest me. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, Lou goes on to say, quote, Several people told me that Reed planned to launch a criminal inquiry with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Mm -hmm. Within the Pentagon, the AFOSI investigates internal matters pertaining to counterintelligence. Hmm. Reed had already seized my computers and files from my office and questioned every one of my employees. When that bore little fruit, Reed cast a wider net, questioning my friends and colleagues. One friend phoned to tell me that she had been cornered by a Reed underling who confided, we're going to nail Lou to the floor. Reed had embarked on a scorched earth policy. <laughs> I, have, I have pissed off some bosses in the day, but this is like a whole different level. <laughs> This is a different thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, according to Politico, uh, quote, in May 2021, Elizondo filed a complaint with the Pentagon's inspector general claiming a coordinated campaign to discredit him for speaking out. Elizondo's complaint makes it clear, quote, malicious activities, coordinated disinformation, professional misconduct, whistleblower reprisal, and explicit threats perpetrated by senior, certain senior level Pentagon officials. Woof. Uh, yeah. Some of, I, I just looked up Gary Reed and he is still in the Pentagon, so. He is still in the Pentagon, but interestingly, uh, Lou filed his uh, inspector general complaint uh, and was immediately embroiled in another complaint against Gary Reed involving sexual misconduct in the office for which he was awesome. demoted and shuffled off to another department. Oh, yeah, but he's <laughs> so still the guy a was a real piece of work. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, all of that, not to mention, as we discussed at the top of the episode, all the m deliberately misleading statements right. from the Pentagon to the press regarding whether a tip was a real program, right? Lou's out here trying to talk to the public, and they're like, no, this guy didn't work here. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's not cool. Um, it got so bad that Senator Reid issued a statement defending Lou, 
Senator Reid said, quote, as one of the original sponsors of ATIP, I can state as a matter of record Lou Elizondo's involvement and leadership role investigating UAPs as the head of ATIP. He performed those duties admirably. Yeah, nice. And Hal Pudoff also made a public statement. Hal said, as an OSAP slash ATIP contractor and senior advisor, I continued to attend meetings, provide briefings, gain access to videos, provide proposed program plans, meet with staff, etc., all under the aegis of Elizondo's leadership and responsibility for maintaining continuity of the program effort and goals until he resigned. Huh. So that's it. Like, that catches us up? Almost. Remember the plan that he yeah. and Jay Stratton had to continue working together and how Lou's public whistleblowing would increase internal demand for UAP research? Yeah. So Elizondo says, quote, As we made progress outside and inside the government, leadership in Navy intelligence, who understood the national security threats related to UAP and now felt public and congressional pressure to, excuse me, to do something about it, tasked Jay with quietly building out a whole-of-government interagency task force, a program with more authorities than ATIP ever had. So Jay started putting that together, handpicking his members and reps from all the intelligence agencies and civilian-led agencies, from the FBI to the NRO to NASA to the FAA. Once it was put together, this would go on to become the Pentagon's UAP task force. Hey. Jay, being positioned to escalate and elevate the issue like this, was exactly what we hoped for. The okay. plan was working. Yeah, so so UAPTF came out of ATIP. That's cool. That's exactly right. Yeah. And UAPTF eventually became Arrow. Yeah. Now that's a much less exciting evolution, but yeah, uh, at some point the Pentagon was ordered by Congress to create an internal body right. and that's when they started pushing back. They tried to create like an office somewhere in the end, they did create arrow, but they took it away from Stratton. Now I remember at the time people saying, why won't they let Jay Stratton keep running it? And I didn't really know who Jay Stratton was or why right. we wanted him to run it. So I kind of didn't care. In hindsight, yeah, I'm kind of pissed. Here's the guy that started OSAP, mm -hmm. worked with Lou in ATIP, took over ATIP after Lou left, then ran the UAP task force. Why you would spin up a new UAP office and take the one dude who's been doing it for almost 20 years and not let him keep doing it well, speaks volumes about their intent towards Arrow. Exactly. We know exactly why they didn't. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Um, so while the UAP task force was up and running, Jay Stratton reached out to Lou again. Lou says, quote, Jay needed a rep from Space Force, hmm. but that agency was still getting set up. They were started at the very beginning of 2020. Yeah. Um, and they didn't have a UAP program. So we brainstormed a way to get past this hurdle. Our solution was that I should be a consultant for the U.S. Space Force oh, wow. to help them build their UAP effort and serve the UAP task force that Jay was building. Nice. After some friends connected me with Space Force leadership, they expressed an interest and concern with UAP, although they were not ready to tell that to the world. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, I started working as a contractor for Space Force on the UAP front and getting their unofficial help behind the scenes on my public efforts while also contributing to Jay's UAP task Task force. Well, that's cool. So Lou's working with Space Force on UAP stuff. It's even cooler than you think. Really? He was working with David Grush on UAP stuff at Space Force for the UAP Task Force. Oh my god, that's great. So yeah. our good good boy and Big Daddy Lou both working together. That's great. Absolutely. Now, believe it or not, there's plenty more to talk about here. What? How? Uh, <laughs> hang on. Another episode, right? Like... We'll see. Uh, for now, the short version is that after Lou resigned, he worked closely with Chris Mellon to advocate for disclosure to Congress. And basically every good thing that's come out of Congress with regards to UFOs since 2017 can be traced directly back to Lou and Chris doing the work. Yeah. And it's not exaggerating to say that if the UAP Disclosure Act passes this year, we've got Lou and Chris to thank for it. I mean, it certainly seems like it's not just 2017. It seems like it was, what, all the way since 2007. 
Like, well, yeah, but you know, publicly anyway. advocating with Congress. Yeah, it's before that he was internal. Yeah, yeah still incredible. How, like that. That's an amazing legacy. Yeah. So I think you understand now why it took me so long to put the notes together yeah, on this. Like, it's a mess. It's a tangled yeah. mess. It, sometimes deliberately so. You've got Pentagon yeah. statements that are intentionally obfuscated. You've got former people who worked in the program coming out and saying confusing things. You've got the New York Times article getting the name of the program wrong. You've got a deliberate reuse of an internal nickname for a different program. Like, it, it's almost like it was designed to be hard to keep track of, which when you're internal and trying to keep the thing obfuscated makes a lot of sense, right. but makes your life a lot harder when you have to talk about it in public afterwards. And I kind of understand why Lou came out and went with the simple and straightforward. I was the director of the Pentagon's UFO program, a tip. Yeah. And just, I don't think put a lot of effort into correcting people when they started talking about OSAP and ATIP, which he was not director of, but he was a senior member of over time and took over responsibility. And when the Pentagon comes out and says, this is not an official program and it had no funding or staff, they're not wrong, Yeah, but they're also not right. Yeah. And, I don't know. The whole thing is really exhausting and frustrating, but I will tell you this for me, at least after all this research where I've landed is I am more confident than ever that Lou is telling the truth that he did run at least the military side of the UAP program for the Pentagon. Sure. He was involved in OSAP, which was a much broader effort. He worked closely with Hal Pudoff, Eric Davis, Jim Blikatsky, Jay Stratton, all these guys. Mm -hmm. And when he comes out and tells us, these are the reasons I quit, I was frustrated that I couldn't get anyone to take it seriously. He gave us the shorthand version of that in 2017. He was like, okay. I tried to direct, uh, brief the SecDef and couldn't get access to him. Right. And it seemed like kind of a weird thing to say, but we now have a little more context for, we found the legacy program and right. were denied access to it. We asked for the access rights we would need to get access and were denied because right. they've set up this catch-22. We tried to set up an observation program and were denied. We dealt with weird religious objections from yeah. the chain of command who were very explicit that they would shut down any attempt to look into this because it's demonic. Yeah, I get it. I get why he quit. I think the plan he came up with is great. I hope that it works. It seems to be working, but yeah. it's not done yet. Yeah. Anyway, I have been talking for an hour and a half about Lou Elizondo and how he saved the Pentagon from UFOs. What do you think, man? Like, this was a lot. Like, where, where are you at? Yeah. To me, this tells the story of someone who's trying very hard to work the system and live in that sort of like gray mm -hmm. space in between things and trying to play the game the best he could but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the game was just rigged against him and uh <laughs> this is a case of the 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 random number generator dealt him a shit hand right uh, yeah yeah <laughs> like yeah rn jesus was not with him in this, this yeah, lo load a new save, Lou. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, just uh, ascend and reset, my man. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it it sounds maddening. Uh, it also mm -hmm. sounds exactly like my work. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't blame him for quitting. And it makes me think maybe I need to retire and write a, a tell-all book. <laughs> Oh shit! All right. <laughs> I, I don't think the new relic whistleblower. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a much less exciting book. It did not make number one on the New no, York Times it bestseller. Would not. <laughs> I was okay over there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. It's it's been wild digging into this stuff, and I kind of going back to what Matthew Pine said about how this summer the goal is not to make new extraordinary claims. Mm -hmm. It's to have more and more senior, credible people come out and back up David Grush's claims. Mm -hmm. Now, David Grush made a huge splash when he came out 
But Lou is making an even bigger splash here. Yeah. Number one, New York Times bestseller. Number two on Amazon. Interviews on CNN. Interviews on Rogan. Like, he is getting out there. He's talking to the people. He's keeping all of this stuff on the, the tip of mind as we're heading into Congress debating about the UAP Disclosure Act. And we can right. only assume that just like he's been doing the whole time since he resigned, he's working closely with Chris Mellon and talking to Congress and keeping the pressure on them to get the UAP Disclosure Act passed. And as we've talked about before, UAP Disclosure Act is not automatic magic disclosure, right. but it's a big freaking step in that direction. That yeah. bill has some teeth to it yeah. in a way that has been battle honed mm -hmm. <laughs> over the last five years of Pentagon resistance. They now know like, okay, here are the tools they're going to pull out to try to stop us. We wrote this law to yeah. defang every single one of their defenses. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The uh, eminent domain clause was in the UAPDA version one was yeah. the thing that they fought so hard against, but at least one of the contractors would love to get rid of it. That's yeah. interesting. Maybe they're not. Yeah, and I think given a little bit more of the context here about Lou trying to get access to it and the defense contractors wanting to get rid of it and the yeah. CIA and the intelligence community shutting down access, um, the eminent domain clause makes a little more sense. Like, mm. look, it's not up to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> this material will be shared. Mm. Um I think we're suffering from one of those things where, you know, like when uh, the Skinwalker Ranch guys, Brandon Fugel and Tim Taylor come out and say, eminent domain means they could come take Skinwalker Ranch from us. He's not wrong. That's what the law says. But I think we're dealing with an imperfect legal tool where I don't think there are a lot of ways for them to say what they're trying to say, which is you don't get to tell us no when you are an illegal legacy program hiding non-human remains. Like, those are now available to the government. I don't think that translates to Brandon Fugel hand over the keys to the ranch. I might be wrong. Who knows, right? Programs get abused all the time. I don't yeah. fault them for having concerns, but... I think this is definitely one of those things where like the tool in the law is kind of a blunt hammer and I would love to see them make a more, uh, you know, carefully defined cutout of what they're actually trying to do. I also still kind of wonder if the eminent domain isn't in there as a bartering chip. Mm. Like you come in and you say, we want everything that's in there. And all the people who said no last year, see that you're serious and they try to haggle you down and you give up the part you don't really care about. Maybe sure. that's eminent domain. Yeah, maybe. Know. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the thing about eminent domain is that like, it's just, you end up in from, from what I hear, you just end mm -hmm. up in um, like legal proceedings, pretty much guaranteed. Um, oh yeah. Because yeah, for sure you have to be able to like the government has to be able to prove that it's important for public use, whatever that means. And that mm -hmm. the current owner is receiving just compensation, whatever that means. And it's like, how do you define just compensation for a crash for flying a saucer? Yeah. A UFO, like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. You can't even. Uh, or you can't maybe even the, just... the counterpoint is there. They've had it for 50 years and have proven derived zero value from it. <laughs> we'll give you a dollar. Yeah, right? <laughs> Take it out of your hands. Oh my God. All right. Y'all, thank you so much for joining us on It's a Very Exciting Time. You can find show notes and more on our website, veryexcitingtime.com, as well as links to our Discord and social media accounts. You can also email us at Scott or Chuck at Very Exciting Time, although honestly, we're on Discord a lot more. And if you'd like to <laughs> support the show, um, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Very Exciting Time, where you can even join as a free, uh, free member, which actually does help. Yeah, for sure. And Chuck, as always, my wife thanks you for listening to me talk about UFOs so she doesn't have to. <laughs>